So hi everyone again, my name is Dr. Jody Dewey um, and I am a research scientist with Chestnut Health Systems Lighthouse Institute. Um, most of the work that we work on right now is public health, issues related to COVID and um, the opioid crisis. Um, however, I'm here today to talk about the research that I've been engaged with since 2008 on transgender healthcare in the US. And so I'm going to present uh, on one of the papers that actually um, was accepted for publication. Uh, it's a paper that I'm working on or that I worked on with Ellie Oppenheim out of London. So um, I wanted to give credit to them as well, okay? So thank you so much. So let's go ahead and get started because we're a little behind. Um, so a few things, just some guiding questions that I have with the work that I'm gonna present for, for you today is what can an investigation of the healthcare system tell us about the treatment of trans people, their access to care and their value in society? And what can a study on the ways trans people are regulated in the healthcare system tell us broadly about our cultural, social, and historical treatment of gender itself? And how can addressing the way trans people are regulated benefit all people? So if we have a better understanding of how those most marginalized are um, dealt with within these systems, how might we um, uh, create a more equitable system for all of us? All right, so, um, you know, <sighs> This is, if you saw my last presentation, some of this is going to be, that was sort of a setup and a little bit is, is tethered to it, but um, we are in a fascinating time in our understanding about gender. Um, we're no longer, you know, confined to university <coughs> classrooms or psychiatric, medical, political circles to talk about issues such as this, but discussions about gender and sexuality have made it to the mainstream. Now more than ever, we're exposed to the meaning of gender, uh, the gender binary and those who transgress it in new ways. We've moved from the titillating depictions of transgender people as deviants or pariahs paraded on afternoon talk shows and um, that increased normalizing, increasing normalizing images in movies and in government. And we've become more sensitive to the challenges of being trans through very public transitions um, um, of Caitlyn Jenner and Chaz Bono. Certainly trans identified individuals and gender issues more broadly have become mainstream and I don't know if some of you remember, you might be a little too young, but in 2016, we saw the first um, trans-identified nine-year-old girl, um, um, Avery um, Jackson, on the cover of National Geographic. And accompanying this issue was the release of Katie Couric's similarly titled one-hour highlight about gender. And I remember when this came out, it was something that I included in one of my classes to show the students. Um, aside from her arguably disturbing touristic approach to investigating gender in which she aligns herself with the perceived um, normality of the gender normative audience, she attempts to diminish difference and normalize uh, gender by stating that we are, quote, we are all the same and that we need to have tolerance. Um, but my perspective is that we are not the same, right? Trans individuals are more likely uh, to be murdered, and despite the argument that trans people um, using the bathroom or the choosing would create more attacks on unsuspecting cisgendered people, it is transgender people um, who are more likely to be accosted, assaulted, and harmed. As social researchers, we investigate how people are shaped and ordered through specific cultural, social, and historical relations. Now, we've seen considerable strides towards transgender equality politically, legally, and culturally. During his presidency, former President Obama publicly instructed public schools to meet the needs of its transgender students, allowing them access to the bathroom and other spaces that match their gender identity. Increasingly, we have witnessed organizations' success in applying Title IX, a 1972 law prohibiting sex discrimination in any federally funded education program or activity, ensuring equality in education and school activities for men and women to meet the needs of also transgender individuals. However, many of these progressive changes were rolled back by former President Trump. Under his watch, we saw an immense focus on state and individual rights. And despite current President Biden's attempt to restore these protections, um, such as eliminating conversion therapy and barriers to healthcare treatment for transgender youth, we, conti we continue to see pushback at the state level. But under Biden, we also saw the first transgender woman confirmed as the 17th Assistant Secretary for Health for the US Department uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, just a, a little side note, um, because I am a member of WPATH, and so we do receive a lot of emails that come through from uh, professionals. One particular professional was seeking out some assistance because in the state of Michigan, 
there is a bill that is being introduced, um, House Bill 6454, which would make it um, a crime of child abuse for any uh, medical professional or parent who seeks out access to healthcare or um, transgender, gender affirming services for their child. So um, even though, um, you know, Trump is no longer in office, um, we still see a lot of this pushback um, to eliminate trans people's rights. Um, but, you know, again, um, thinking about how things have progressed, is that really progress? Is it something else? It's within the multiple systems which we find ourselves that these debates get argued out. Does the fact that we are able to talk about trans people or gender and sexuality more freely, does it create more inclusivity, legitimacy, and access to human rights for trans people? And more broadly, how do these discussions matter for cisgender people? Um, as every good sociologist asks, why does any of this matter? Again, Katie uh, Kirk says that trans people are just like us, but to, but to ignore the social processes in place that continue to construct the boundaries of normality by which some are defined and others are a race is to obscure the power of regulatory systems and legitimizing some at the expense of others and to ignore the limits of such a system and eliminating the barriers to true gender revolution. What I will present for you today is a complicated picture of the ways that one regulatory system, the healthcare system, works to normalize and regulate, works to norm normalize um, and regulate trans people seeking out services and in so doing may diminish the progressiveness imagined by a true gender revolution. So the work that I'm gonna present for you today is based on um, uh, really, I mean, specifically, it's based on the interviews that I conducted between 2015 and 16 of 20 medical mental health professionals. That was the second round that I interviewed individuals. I first started interviewing medical um, professionals in 2008, 2009. And prior to that, which was the impetus of why I continued this project, was because um, when I interviewed trans identified people who were members of one particular social group in the Chicago line area, that was the biggest issue for them was navigating healthcare. And so that's sort of how I, I got into investigating the healthcare system. Um, let's see. Okay, so having begun this work in 2008, the data I present for you today specifically derives from the 2015-16 interviews with 22 providers. Um, all of them were WPATH members at the time. That's how I access the, um, the list of providers. Um, so again, Katie Couric appears to normalize trans identified people by drawing parallels between then uh, between them and cisgendered people by using a normalizing and a biologizing framework, she attempts to eradicate difference in hopes that the audience, assumed to be cisgendered people, will accept or at least tolerate gender and sexual difference. She uses legitimizing knowledge to state the case for acceptance. After all, if science or medicine claims its realness, then so should you. But the problem is that in all this work to create acceptance, we are incapable of moving past the benevolency of the effort to investigate the process of legitimization that can also work to delegitimize the very people for whom this effort began. Um, so a little bit of theory to kind of set the stage of what, what I will present for you. Um, according to Wilkins, categorization does not lead to the ability to oppress, right? So it's not this observance of categories and then therefore um, we, we have um, a basis for oppressing, but rather, uh, they flip that around, right? The desire to oppress changes the way we see so that we then categorize in a particular way, right? This idea is concretized in the work of Hill Collins, right? Who argues that the desire, um, so Hill Collins work, um, controlling images, um, if you've read it, it's definitely something that, um, if you haven't read it, you should, but it's a lot in race theory. Um, but the desire to control Africans <clears throat> drove the science that saw them as primitive, backward, and in need of control, right? Hill Collins speaks about controlling images about black deviant sexuality in which, in which presenting uh, black people as dangerous, aggressive, and hypersexualized justifies their enslavement, imprisonment, and the unrapeability of black men and women, right? Um, similar controlling images about those who transgress natural gender and sexual presentation and, identi and identity justify the over-criminalization, abusive treatments, 
and neglect experience at the hands of all systems, including the criminal justice system. Um, if you haven't read this book, Joey Mogul, Andrea Ritchie, and um, uh, the last name is slipping my mind, it's Whitlock is the last name, um, writes a similar book based on these controlling images about trans people. According, according to Mogul, um, trans individuals are identified often seen as disease spreaders, queer killers, and the sexual predator that works to erase them as victims of crime and makes them more accountable as perpetrators. These images are so powerful that one's very skin color or their gender alone marks them and they're equated with criminality, hence the well-known term driving while black or walking while trans, right? So following the idea then sort of moving us then to these dueling dualisms that Anne Fausto Sterling, Sterling talks about, to effectively create these controlling images, right? To create these images, we also need its opposite, right? Namely, the perception of a white pure femininity. Systems such as the criminal justice system are connected to the medical system, right? We think about Foucault, the way these, these, these systems tie together, often using previously constructed categories as guidance and how one should be viewed and processed. Foucault uh, spoke about the overlap of the criminal justice and medical psychiatric systems that work to regulate a person's life beyond the initial crime and include more agents of judgment beyond the role of the actual courtroom judge. By naming, we have the ability to regulate and control. So Mogul argues that any attempt to eradicate the problem within the system that oppresses will never truly solve the problem. So let me read that again. Mogul argues that any attempt to eradicate a problem within the system that oppresses them will never truly solve the problem because the system itself is based upon the desire to oppress. So damaging archetypes are embedded into the structure of the system. So for the work I present for you today, the question becomes, can we ever expect to normalize a group of people, a behavior or an identity, a presentation within a system whose very inception is based on recognizing deviance and um, difference. Can we ever depathologize trans people through a system that is meant to pathologize? And how in all of this progressiveness with new language and new tools do we inadvertently continue to undermine the autonomy and humanity of trans people? Okay, so let's get into um, the regulation of medicine and science. So medicine is another regulatory system it perpetuates in response to these same controlling images, right? Broadly speaking, medicalization is a process by which bodies and everyday experiences become increasingly defined, understood, and responded to using medical language experts and logic. Cultural norms are obscured under science, and it's biologizing framework that is often perceived by society as static and objective. Similar to oppression as a catalyst for categorization, medicine does not merely respond to bodily configurations by diagnosing, but it is its power, right? The power to diagnose and desire to medicalize all bodies that everyone then becomes diagnosable and treatable. Diagnosis is a language of social control and it is a process. Um, these same controlling images impact both the experience of healthcare by trans identified patients and the decisions made by physicians and therapists while appearing progressive in their changes. The documents and how they are incorporated into the treatment of trans people may work to narrow rather than expand our understanding of gender. Okay. Um, so to speak more specifically to gender legitimization, there are benefits to medicalization, right? Um, you know, for, for individuals who didn't have access to healthcare, diagnosis provides that pathway, right? If we can recognize this as a medical issue rather than a sin or a crime, um, then it's perhaps this pathway is, is better than this other pathway was, right? Um, it legitimizes different, it, it makes one recognizable, right? So that's even important in the, in the, in the transgender community that I've seen, right? Um, naming provides access uh, to space as well. It extends one's boundaries, right? Um, and a lot of the work that I've done um, for trans people who identify as transgender, their doctors will write them a letter. And um, several people have called this their get out of jail free card, right? They keep it on them. Because if they are accosted by somebody, let's say in a bathroom or, um, you know, a, a one gender only space, they can present this to legitimize um, their, their transgender identity. Um, and so there are some benefits to diagnoses. Oops, sorry. Um, 
But there's also some issues with that, right? Um, so it requires self-pathologization. Trans people need to self-pathologize in order to enter into the system to get the services that they need. Um, through naming, also a hierarchy, de a hierarchy develops, and, it, and, and at times it can erase others. So what happens is that you know, in, in, our, in our need to identify um, transgender individuals within this system, again, it's still very much a binary system. And so the idea of gender fluidity or sexual fluidity often sort of gets crammed into, again, just two or three boxes or just three boxes instead of, you know, just two. So we get one more box, maybe, maybe one other box. Um, but it doesn't really allow for the nuance uh, of, of, of our humanness, right? And it also requires a relationship with a therapist and doctor. So it hooks, uh, it hooks us into a system, right? Um, of working with, as Foucault would say, these you know, additional agents to that, that manage more parts of our lives. Um, right, and one's access to care propels the legal construction of sex, right? So these, these, these logic systems then get tethered to and pulled into other domains. Um, okay. So let's see. So how professionals understand and apply transgender healthcare tools displays both the complexity of their work in treating trans people as well as, as, well as the factors that impact treatment process or responses. By investigating the process through which health professionals make treatment decisions with trans uh, individuals seeking treatment, we can elucidate the scientific and cultural logic that drive care and in turn investigate how treatment decisions perpetuate the challenge um, and challenge broader anxieties about transgender identity and care access. So um, first to talk about living documents, right? The DSM is a psychiatric doc document created by, I don't know why that didn't, um, created by the American Psychiatric Association. It was published in 2013. The DSM-5 saw the shift. Um, so one of the biggest shifts was uh, from gender identity disorder to gender dysphoria. This move was meant to depathologize um, by, you know, changing the language itself, right? Literally taking disorder out of there, um, but also reclassifying that from a chapter titled sexual dysfunction and paraphilic disorder to a reclassification to its own chapter. So these changes were meant to emphasize the, um, so to change it to gender dysphoria, the change was meant to, to emphasize the distress associated with one's mismatch between sex assigned at birth and gender identity rather than labeling all trans people as disordered. The shift out of this category was meant to decouple gender identity from sexual deviance. Um, in terms of the standards of care, the standards of care is the document outlining the clinical process for therapists and physicians working with trans patients who desire to access transitioning services such as hormones and surgeries. This document is created by the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, an organization that is mostly made up of US professionals, but strives to include an, inter, uh, an international scope. Um, not gonna get into that right now. I know right now um, they do have a trans identified professional who is the president, um, but there is still argument on, you know, uh, that person still has a very, very white centered Western um, uh, view of healthcare, right? Um, the standards of care, uh, let's see here. Uh, okay, so this document is created by WPATH and um, changes in the SOC have been significant over each revision, but the biggest change comes from um, SOC 6 and SOC 7. So right now, SOC 8 was just released a few weeks ago. Um, so it'll be interesting if I can continue this work to see how um, practices change over the next couple of years because of the changes in that document. But I want to mentioned this huge change between the SOC 6 and the SOC 7. So the SOC 7 was released in 2011 and the biggest change is the removal of the real life experience for hormones and surgery. So um, prior to the SOC 7, one would need to live in their, um, as they called it, chosen gender for at least a year before, um, I think it was three months before accessing hormones and a year before accessing surgeries. They also uh, needed to be a part of a triadic therapy requiring long-term psychotherapy and removal of formal diagnosis of um, gender dysphoria for every individual presenting gender concerns. Um, so instead of a letter following a lengthier psychotherapeutic relationship, under SOC 7, someone seeking these treatments could provide a referral letter 
or multiple referral letters as required for some treatments from any mental health professional or health professional trained in behavioral health and competent in assessing gender dysphoria. So what's interesting, okay, so let me just kind of back up a minute. So again, the biggest switch between six and seven is there's no longer a triadic psychotherapeutic relationship. What is happening now is um, we're under SOC seven, was a gender assessment. That's what it was called by a lot of the professionals that I interviewed. It's actually a, um, a psychosocial assessment, but a lot of the medical professionals called it a gender assessment, um, which is interesting in and of itself. Um, but while the term changed, the process really didn't because individuals who were still assessing still wanted a lengthy relationship in order to write the letter that was required for the services because that's their name on it. And the requirement of the letter is to basically make the case that this individual is um, really transgender or this individual is prepared or stable or competent. Um, and, you know, it makes me think of this book. It's a great book. Um, it's not about trans people. It's about the criminal justice system in Chicago. Um, and the name is escaping me, but it's called... Um, Crook County, because the name of the court system in Chicago is called Cook County. That's the county we live in. But um, she titled the book Crook County. And she talks about the way defense lawyers, actually their main job, their, their job is not to pre pre present evidence. Their job is to present a um, a viable person. Like, can, can we believe this person um, to be stable, right? Because the assumption is, is somebody who is standing before the judge um, probably committed the crime or, you know, they're these horrible people and it's, it's, it's based around race and around gender. Um, and so she, she talks about this process of the way um, um, defense lawyers have to essentially just sell their clients. And so that's the way I kind of think about what this letter is. It's about creating um, this justification of the, the humanness of this person to access services. And that's what the letter sort of represents. Um, okay, so while, and, and also what's interesting under SOC 7 is that even though um, you no longer need this relationship with a uh, psychiatrist, because you needed one letter from a psychiatrist, um, you still need somebody who's trained in all these, uh, all these elements, right? And so, um, Let's see here. Uh, a trained professional, trained in behavioral health, and competent in assessing gender dysphoria. I think somewhere else it even says um, that they, you know, understand certain um, uh, parts of WPATH and those kinds of things, right? So it's about establishing this expertise. So, um, so while lengthy therapeutic relationship was no longer required under SOC seven, a psychosocial assessment with patient informed consent was required. The psychosocial assessment, which I said was called gender assessment, requires the providers have, this is where it is, the knowledge and experience to assess gender dysphoria, which can be a mental health professional or by an appropriately trained prescribing provider. Further, despite the removal of the long-term therapeutic relationship, the SOC7 advises a complete approach to healthcare that includes, quote, regular communication among health professionals. Right. So again, this is the idea of a team, right? A, a treatment team. The assessment must be performed by a qualified health professional who has earned a degree in clinical behavior sciences and is competent in using the DSM. That was the terminology I was thinking about. Um, while the diagnostic shift from GID to GD to gender dysphoria was meant to reduce the pathologization of gender identities by recognizing that not all trans people experience dysphoria. In practice, what's happening is that the requirement to ensure someone has um, is transgender prior to providing medical interventions means that by default, all patients will essentially be diagnosed, right? So even though the, the depathologization was shifting from G, GID to gender dysphoria, that only people who feel dysphoric should be recognized, the requirement to be identified as such to receive services means that everyone by default will be diagnosed. Okay. Um, so under previous research where I study doctors and therapists treating under SOC 6, I found that GID was categorically problematic because it did not guarantee insurance coverage, forcing providers to work around diagnostic care, uh, um, categories. So in the United States, um, while a doctor would um, diagnose you officially as you know, having gender identity disorder under SOC 6, they couldn't use that term and access 
health insurance. Health insurance wouldn't cover it. Um, so what happened was what I found from the research is that um, so GID uh, as a category is problematic. It did not guarantee insurance coverage, forcing providers to work around them and labeling them as having anxiety or depression. Um, one psychiatrist that I interviewed said, well, you live in Chicago, so I'm, I'm sure everyone is anxious or depressed, right? Um, so again, this, this, this reliance on other diagnostic categories works to further patholo pathologize trans people. It conflates gender with mental illness um, in the name of increased access, right? The medical framing required to connect people to help uh, force providers to construct a disorder narrative deepen, uh, deepens the cultural belief that gender non-conforming individuals are inherently disordered. Patients become part of their own pathologization as they need to be seen as uh, being mentally competent and able to make informed decisions, right? So they have to self, this is interesting, they have to self pathologize in order to then prove their stability to access services. And so to give you an example, one particular quote of a doctor that I, or a counselor that I interviewed said, their assurance that they are standing, this is when she um, provides services, their assurance that they are standing at the edge of their precipice, looking back over their shoulder at everything and every one they ever loved or worked very hard for, and they're ready to lose all of it because, because they come to me at that point where they say, I just don't want to live another day in this body. I can't, I can't do it. So again, there's this idea that, you know, um, you have to, you have to be willing to lose it all. You have to be at the point of literally taking your own life to, sh to show me that you're serious enough about this. But yet, if you speak too much in this way, then you're not mentally stable to make the decision. So for a lot of trans people who have to go through these processes, it's very difficult to know what to say, when to say it, how to say it, because you're balancing between self-pathologization and then trying to establish your stability while also trying to tell the narrative that doctors want, which means that you, you must know you're going to you know, lose everything in your life to, to choose this for yourself, right? Rather than you know, seeing the, the, the humanness and the wonderfulness uh, of, of individuals who sort of you know, understand gender fluidity and going through these experiences. Um, so it, GID is also procedurally problematic. How this diagnosis gets brought into the process of treating is dictated by the standards of care. Um, there is confusion of language as to how much decision-making power providers actually have, fluidity versus eligibility requirements. Part of the process is to create a narrative, a recommendation letter written by a therapist for the physician as proof that one is appropriate for services. The letter relieves professional liability. Because of the conflation of gender, non-normativity, and mental illness, the letter must construct the patient as being both mentally stable and competent to make a decision, which continues to be tethered to practitioner view of gender presentation. So first, one must succumb to a mental health diagnosis to only then work to remove the stigma of having a mental illness to receive services. So a letter creates the patient as compliant, rational, which makes the patient into an object of the medical gaze with more and more of their life brought into medical purview. And this is why we often see, um, you know, through these processes, it's about, you know, asking about their family and asking about their sex life and asking about if everyone's on board at work and, um, you know, trying to get as much support as possible. While the letter is perceived as burdensome and is no longer needed for hormones, a gender assessment is which... Uh, in which essentially produces the same information. So further, there are expectations on who can do this assessment to assess the boundary of the tools and perspective that will be employed to this end. So with the standards of CARE 7 only having, um, having been you know, released um, under this research, I wondered uh, what, if anything, would change with the significant shift between these two versions. While patients no longer have to prove they have a gender identity different than one at birth, they now have to ensure that they are competent and mentally stable to make decisions, something providers attempt to show in their recommendation letter and discussion with other providers, right? Okay, so the perception of the treatment liberal. So what I found in, in the research um, that is that most providers see themselves as one of three categories. Um, they interpreted their role in diagnosing and deciding if one had a real gender issue. So no longer, um, so um, providers, uh, let's see here. Uh, when asked to elaborate and provide examples, the responses fell into one of these general categories. So we have the educator or guide. Um, I'm like a person who, 
you know, sorry, I gotta just move this. I'm like a person who helps carry your bags. Um, how can I move this thing? Oh, never mind. I found it. Okay, perfect. Sorry. There we go. I'm like the person who helps carry your bags as you go through the jungle, right? Um, so some people just saw themselves as a guide or as an educator. Um, interesting that transitioning um, for trans people is equated to a jungle. Um, the stabilizer, right? Family medicine is a huge percentage of counseling psychiatric conditions. I end up being a counselor for their life, right? And so a lot of providers also spoke about, you know, they're there to sort of root or stabilize the, uh, a trans person, right? But again, the assumption is, is that there isn't stability, right? Um, and then the assessor, which is sort of, you know, some people were a little bit more on the gatekeeping end of it, um, but I use the term assessor uh, for these individuals, but really those people who want to make sure there's a correct diagnosis, they still sort of held on to, I need to make this decision if this person um, is transgender and if this, <laughs> these decisions that they're going to make are right for them. Um, okay. So providers discussed their understanding of both the DSM and the SOC. Many indicated that they did not use the DSM and that it was not <laughs> particularly helpful in treating their patients. However, the term GID and GD were used to discuss their patients in letters of recommendation to justify why patients should be provided with transitioning services. So some people indicated that the SOC was a template, right? We were just trying to figure it out. Um, little formalized training, something really to hang your hat on, right? SOC unifies treating um, treatment and allows providers to justify decisions by pointing to a document. It also justifies when providers take on gatekeeping roles. Um, change in diagnostic criteria muddies and complicates self-identity, narrowing the scope of gender and making it more difficult for therapists who wanted to do the right thing by their clients. Um, let's see here. SOC was also an allowance for treatment fluidity, um, and SOC was also seen as, um, as legitimacy, right? Some found that the SOC provided the fluidity they needed to help their patients, one that was less pathologizing, not as a gatekeeper, but to facilitate transition. Some saw it as providing a roadmap, for example, or um, that they didn't see the standards as being really set in stone. So it just allowed them some fluidity in how they were going to treat. Um, one person said, if the standards of care freely lets me do what I think is right to do, right? So, um, and this is interesting because I think that this is a complaint of the standards of care is that in its fluidity, um, it doesn't say anything very specific at all. And so what happens then is that different research teams or treatment teams are left to create their own sort of model of care. And others saw the standards of care as legitimizing the work that they do, especially those working with youth. It provides legitimacy when providers choose to forego or deny care, right? One doctor used it to avoid having patients, as he says, quote, pushing me around. Some say patients, um, some saw patients as presenting as if they deserve treatment and that they were over demanding. So for those individuals, the standards of care um, allowed them to deny care, right? The assessment uh, replaced the lengthy, lengthy psychotherapeutic relationship. However, the elements and purpose of this are retained in what many call a gender assessment. So provider self-perceptions, um, let's see. So provider self-perceptions as necessary educators, guides, stabilizers, and assessors remove autonomy from the trans person, person positioning them as a patient with limited under, self-understanding who cannot make decisions for themselves. Of course, it is not the availability of emotional, practical, and educational support from professionals that leaves trans people disempowered. Trans people should be able to access this support from <clears throat> professionals where desired. But the perception is that practitioner roles are a prerequisite to transition. This position neglects the expertise that trans people develop through their own lived experiences, as well as the extensive research that trans people invest in understanding their own identities. Um, this is most, and as I said, I, SOC 8 has been released. I have not um, gone through it line by line like I want to do. I've started looking through it. And I think that the most bothersome thing to me is that the introduction itself doesn't even cite um, so it makes a lot of claims, which um, I know I've read before and probably um, I've read from a lot of, you know, trans identified authors and professionals. Um, so why it's not cited, I'm not really sure, but I, I 
I think that it's obvious that there isn't a deep connection with that community. Um, so basically, um, so the, the changes do not significantly alter pater paternalism within the practice of treating trans people and will not significantly alter patients' access to services or experience with care. Um, it also may not shift the deeply held cultural views pertaining to gender, mental health, and patient competency entrenched in diagnostic care categories. It also fails to address the interlocking collaboration between doctors and therapists that form quality care in which uh, powerful systems continue <coughs> to dominate knowledge and regulate medical therapeutic processes that expand um, social control. And it also may obscure our critical analysis of how the process violates human rights in the name of progress, increase access, or demedicalization. Um, the standards of care seven does throw out the term harm reduction and uh, human rights, but um, to what extent it understands it, defines it, and sets clear guidelines on it um, is unclear. So, Sorry, I just read through that. Um, so in conclusion, controlling images and medical tools that continue to conflate gender with mental illness forces trans people to self pathologize and then present their sanity to access services will always undermine the ability to build trusting and honest relationships with the provider. And I think that's something that we forget, right? And that's uh, an article that I had published years ago um, from my work in studying um, trans identified individuals themselves is that um, you know, it's, it, under, it undermines a trusting relationship that they should have the right to have, right? Um, if standards to treat trans people were truly progressive and included self-identification, experts in the organizations in which the standards form would perhaps argue themselves out of relevancy and be <laughs> incapable to sustain and safeguard their institutional authority in transgender health. So bringing us back to Mogul's ideas, the problem with these systems is that we cannot expect them to provide true legitimization, uh, legitimation and depathologization depatholo when their impetus is to categorize, define, and separate. In legitimizing one, it disparages others. A system based on recognizing difference is required to strengthen the divide and the boundaries between identities. It must create a deviant other, right? And so we see this with terms like autogynephilia, um, you know, and just having different uh, terms to decide who gets access and who doesn't. It must create a deviant other to justify the non-deviancy of the other. How do we effectively argue for the respect and access uh, to rights for trans people when doing so requires that we dispar disparage others? How do we expect that the rights of cisgendered people will be respected if they are based on the denial of rights for others? We cannot expect a system that was created to understand normality from abnormality to succeed at normalizing trans people without the risk of harming others. We have to find solutions outside this system. Thank you.